Welcome back now in conversation with our health minister. Following the United Kingdom's Oxford University research, testing and use of the steroid drug dexamethasone, the South African Ministerial Advisory Committee have approved its use locally to treat COVID-19 patients who are very sick. It's also finalizing clinical protocols. It is important to note that this drug is only beneficial for extremely ill COVID patients who are either on a ventilator or are being given oxygen and is said to have little to no effect for other COVID-19 patients. All right, well, joining us to talk about this and other COVID-19 related issues, as well as your questions, if you'd like to send them through, you're more than welcome. Uh, we've got the Health Minister, Dr. Zwilliam Kieser. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you very, very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Leanne, and uh, all of you us. Let's start off first with the, 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 the issue of uh, dexamethasone. Uh, first of all, tell us about the use of this drug. Obviously, as I've said in the introduction, this is for extremely sick COVID-19 patients only. Um, you know, it, it results coming from the UK showing that it actually helps a third of <coughs> patients. So this is the light we've been looking for. Well, actually, uh, dexamethasone, is a, a drug that's been in use for a long time. It has been used largely in situations where we're dealing with uh, what we call autoimmune uh, reaction. And this is a situation where the body uh, is reacting to a particular challenge and therefore uh, creates certain uh, reaction that uh, begins to destroy its own tissues. And so you use the drugs which are called glucocorticoids or glucocorticosteroids. Now, these drugs uh, largely are used like in acute asthma when it's very severe. It's, uh, they are used also if you've got uh, brain injuries with edema where the brain is swelling, where there's inflammation on the joints and different parts of the body. So it has actually been used quite a lot. And in this case, uh, the doctors have already been using it in uh, the COVID situation to help to strengthen the patient's response. Uh, to the treatment. Now, the discovery by the Oxford University in, the, in their research that uh, it's made an impact on 20% uh, <clears throat> of the people who are on oxygen and one third of those on ventilators. It's a huge boost in our armaments of dealing with this issue uh, of COVID-19. So already our uh, clinical um, uh, clinicians committee uh, uh, which is a part of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, is uh, finalizing the uh, protocols to make sure that this can be used as a standard treatment, even though many of the intensive care specialists have already been using it in the country. So it's actually a very, very good uh, you know, uh, report that gives us a sense that uh, it's going to be standard uh, use in all the situations. So the drug has been always uh, available. In the country, we do have uh, uh, stocks, and we're going to have to increase the stocks. But in addition, it is actually quite exciting because this is a drug that is uh, uh, the licenses uh, to to do this drug all over the world are owned by a South African company, and so uh, we believe that uh, it's really a, a, a boost in the fight against COVID-19. It doesn't fight directly against the virus, but it does fight against the bodies reaction to the virus, which is really where most of the problems come from that makes people more sick. But it's only useful for those who are very sick. And in this case, about 20% or so of the people will end up being hospitalized. And then, um, you know, maybe 5 10% end up in, in intensive care units. Right now, we've got about 2,000 of those people in hospital. Only 400 are in uh, high care or in intensive care, and then uh, about 150 are in ventilators. That's where we're going to be focusing the treatment on. Fantastic. I mean, this is really great news and, and, and hope for people that are in a very dire situation. What about um, people with comorbidities? Uh, how does the drug work on them, <clears throat> such as diabetes and heart disease? Well, actually, you can use the steroids in almost all the other uh, comorbidities. Uh, where the steroid becomes a problem <clears throat> is when you might be having a, an acute uh, bacterial infection that is spread all over the body where you might be worried that it worsens the situation. Those are some of the few instances where, where there's a concern. But on the other comorbidities, uh, the doctors generally will try it and, and see if it works. Half the time is a 
a drug that uh, do doctors call on to rescue a difficult situation when they are resuscitating uh, a, a patient or when they are uh, you know, uh, treating a patient who's in a very difficult condition. So uh, it will be used across all comorbidities, except in the few instances where steroid may not be uh, indicated. And so that doesn't happen many times. So I think that it's really going to strengthen the, the, the hands of the clinicians in the fight against uh, um, uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So, Minister, we know that, as you mentioned, it is, it is here, it is widely <clears throat> available. It's easy for South Africa. I mean, it's great news as well, uh, I would assume, for the economy of the country as well, to have this kind of uh, drug being here in South Africa with licenses in South Africa as well. Is it now already being used in hospitals for these patients you talk of? Actually, it's being used. It has been used many years ago when I was in clinical practice. It's something that we used to use quite frequently. And uh, all the doctors will tell you this is really a very, very helpful drug. Uh, however, because of the new situation, I think the confirmation that it's got a direct impact is really where the I think all the uh, uh, clinicians are excited about. Uh, we we don't manufacture it directly in South Africa. We manufacture other types of the uh, steroids, uh, but then uh, uh, we, the company is uh, South African, so we are uh, already making arrangements. It's going to take us a while to be able to build our own capacity to a point where we can do our own manufacturing. However, that doesn't derail us because we will still be uh, accessing additional uh, stocks uh, wherever they will be available. But that is good news. I think uh, all of us are very happy. Of course, the doctors have already been using it because of the effect that they've known of it. But uh, with the proof now, uh, it really makes the uh, treatment regimen very strong. Good. So, Minister, let's, let's just uh, one more question on that and then we can move away from it. <coughs> Are there any side effects of somebody that is not necessarily as sick as what you have stipulated, those that are on ventilators in, in, in hospitals, but they, they still are very, very sick, having difficulty with breathing. You have said it's only for the very, very extremely sick patients, but if you're not at that level, are there any side effects? Is there, uh, is there any warning against taking it to assist you in some way? Well, uh, the, according to the reports, uh, it does not have an impact on those who have got a very mild uh, a disease. Generally, uh, uh, corticosteroids uh, become problematic in two situations. One is in situations where uh, someone is taking it over a long time without proper monitoring. Now, doctors will always warn you on that because it creates uh, other side effects. And uh, those side effects can be long lasting. So uh, doctors always have to prescribe and monitor if the side effects are showing. But it doesn't happen if you've got an acute infection like this one. The second area where there may be challenges with the uh, uh, steroids is in the area which I indicated. If someone has got something which is like a, <clears throat> a, a disseminated infection, an infection that spread all over the body, or an infection that's got a risk of doing so, it may create a situation where the body's defense mechanism is reduced and therefore the individual might uh, succumb more to that kind of infection. So those situations, the doctors are always on their alert on, and so uh, they tend to really avoid uh, a situation that might compromise the patient. So I would say largely um, it's a generally safe drug to use, especially if it's, under, it's done under uh, you know, uh, cl uh, clinician supervision. Uh, and from the point of view of the, the intensive care specialists, they live on it, they work on it all the time. So it's really not a, a risky drug because uh, it tends to be in the hands of very experienced people who know exactly how much and when to use it. I, I, turning my attention, I did open the, the, the floor to questions from anybody asking uh, some related questions. This one I've just picked up from Darren Felix saying, is the drug use... Uh, safe during pregnancy? <clears throat> well, uh, most of the drugs, uh, there has to be caution in pregnancy. And uh, in this case, uh, it's the doctor who has to work on the supervision. If it's a very limited and short uh, term use, uh, particularly in uh, dealing with a particular response, it tends to be uh, you know, less problematic. And in this case, uh, you might be dealing with a situation where 
You have to actually decide whether is it safer to uh, um, uh, avoid using the drug or uh, it's much more important to save the life of the mother. In which case, you deal with the mother and then look at whether there are complications that are arising out of that. But generally, again, I would say uh, I wouldn't uh, raise that as a matter of uh, serious concern. The doctors will have to assess the case by case and see whether there's any particular problem they'll be concerned about. Let's move on now and let's talk to the president's announcement last night. Um, quite a lot of loosening <coughs> of the restrictions that we are seeing. Uh, South Africans are a little bit worried because, Minister, the, the numbers are now rising. It, it shouldn't be a surprise to us. You've been warning us for uh, many months now <coughs> that this is the time. This is the, the moment that, unfortunately, we're going to see a lot of infections. We're going to see a lot of deaths being reported. From now until August is a very difficult time. However, opening up casinos, opening up restaurants, uh, uh, you know, other places like this, South Africans are now thinking you know, okay, well, let's go out and live because we've got no option. I, what, was, what is your reaction to all of this? Well, uh, you might recall uh, uh, several weeks ago, probably two months ago, I was talking to my colleagues and we warned of a heavy storm. Uh, I think we must say that at this point we are actually driving right into the storm. That means that uh, the... Uh, you know, impact of the uh, pandemic uh, uh, is going to be a challenge. Uh, and so uh, it's going to be important for us to know that, uh, <clears throat> that it's going to be important that uh, 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 that we, we deal with uh, the uh, changes that have to be done in our lives. In the, in the meantime, uh, the, you, you can't let the whole... <clears throat> The whole uh, country go on the restrictions, and yet uh, there's going to be hunger and starvation. There are going to be challenges of um, um, there are going to be challenges of uh, um, you know, economy that is not doing well. All of these issues have to be balanced. So we have to balance the lives and the livelihoods. And balancing the two is a contradiction because anything that's going to make the uh, uh, the yeah, transmission to get less is going to require that we must restrict movement. Anything that's going to improve the economy is going to require that we move people around and make sure that normal activities are, are, are encouraged. So we now are saying there's a new way of behavior to coexist with the virus. So that means that we must focus on the issue of use of masks, of uh, you know sanitizers, hand washing, distancing, that's the only way we can do the two together, and that is to reduce the spread of the infection at the same time reactivate our economies. A lot of it is going to be, you know, a kind of trial and error where one area, for example, we have seen what's happening in the schools. Uh, we'd like the schools to open because uh, we're going to be with this viral infection for the next two years or three before we get a vaccine. But uh, by that time, we will not be able to close all the need for the virus, viral infection to pass. So for that reason, this is a pandemic that's worrying the whole world. And so we check lessons from various other parts of the world and uh, take some of what we think will be useful. So um, uh, the adjusting is going to take a lot of unity of purpose for South Africans. It's also going to take a lot of cooperation amongst ourselves. It's going to also mean we have to balance the behavioral change with restrictions. In our case, the restrictions were mainly to guide people to see what kind of conduct is going to be useful. Now people have learned quite a bit, and you can see many people are wearing masks and so on, but now they need to understand that our lives depend on it. And so these changes are going to be what we have to do to, me, to be able to say, on the one side, we are trying to contain the infection. On the other side, we are trying to uh, get our economy to recover and then normalize our social activities. But that is going to, we are still driving into a heavy storm. I think we need to be upfront that um, we still expect that the numbers are going to rise. We still expect that uh, more people might be admitted to hospitals. We have uh, prepared more beds for the hospitals. We have employed more staff. We're you know, procuring more um, uh, ventilators. We're really preparing on the one side. But what will help us most is when all South Africans know that they can actually change the cause of the pandemic. 
by uh, focusing on the containment measures, that when someone is infected, uh, they need to go out for isolation, and those who are associated must still go for quarantine. It's not like now we're saying, you know, everything is fine, let's just move on without worrying. We have to be even more careful now because the, uh, the uh, spread of the infection is much higher today than it was when we did the lockdown. But that we benefited by doing the lockdown is without a doubt. At that time, we would have probably, you know, passed the numbers we have today many, many weeks ago if we had allowed that rate of spread to continue without any interruption. President was indicating, for example, that when we took the decisions, the every two days you had twice the number of uh, 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 infections, which means the doubling time took two days at that time. But after the lockdown, it took about two weeks, 15 days, to actually double the numbers. That bought us a little bit of time. Now, as we are opening up, we're seeing that <clears throat> the doubling time is now uh, coming down to about 12 days. In some areas, it's even less. It's about nine days, like in the Western Cape. So that is the issue that we need to always be watching, that it is in our hands <clears throat> to be able to see how we can actually slow down the infection. And that's really the key of the message. I don't think uh, from the beginning we did say we won't stop the infection, we want to try and slow it down. Now, people can't say because uh, we have now said we are loosening the rules. That means it's the rules that have been loosened. It's not the pandemic that's loosened. The pandemic is still raging and it is going to be as effective in terms of its uh, impact on us as uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we, we didn't do anything. So we need to then know uh, a do-nothing scenario doesn't help. What is important is we must keep trying to contain the infection and therefore protect those who are vulnerable. Those who can stay and work at home must still continue. Where we have got to do work and uh, as groups, we must make sure that there's distancing and make sure that everybody is wearing a mask. And you don't need to worry about uh, you know, a police to say, uh, it's not because of fear of police or being arrested that you wear a mask. It's because you are, uh, you are protecting yourself and you're protecting others. And uh, the distancing <clears throat> is also because you love your, you know, your your friends, your relatives. That's the reason why you mustn't be, you know, uh, 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 hugging and shaking hands and so on. You know, it's a very difficult situation for us to do, but we have to adjust because if we don't adjust, then of course there is not much hope of containing this infection. But some people, I mean, you, you, you end your answer on talking on friends and relatives, and some people are really battling to understand the move. In the beginning, it was kind of, you know, don't do anything, sit tight. That was the order, and we did it. Now, things are opening up. Like, for instance, you can go to a restaurant, you can, uh, you can go to church as long as it's in small groups, and you can, but you're not allowed to see your friends and your family. And, you know, the, the, there are some things that just don't make sense. I know that it's been told that it's scientific evidence that's been given and advice from different <coughs> areas. And, but, you know, we're, sometimes people and South Africans are, are questioning this advice and the way things are moving right now. Well, uh, people can question anything, but uh, we have to go by some kind of guide. In this case, you know, uh, I read one very simple uh, explanation in the Lancet uh, uh, magazine, uh, uh, that in the Lancet Journal, uh, they said if you want to stop the pandemic, you have to stop the virus from moving. To stop the virus from moving, you must stop people from moving because it moves from person to person. Now, in this case, when we said we locked down, everybody must stay at home. We actually wanted to make sure that at that time, <clears throat> the rate at which the virus was spreading was slowed down by the fact that people stopped moving for that period. And when they did so, it actually had an effect of reducing the numbers of uh, infection that we could have had at the time. We would have really long passed these numbers uh, way back in March if we had not done that. And so, uh, because it didn't happen, people may not be able to believe that it could have happened. We actually have got evidence that it was going to be much worse. But it does not mean that uh, uh, it's going to be better now that we had the initial phase of a lockdown. It means that uh, 
what was going to happen at that time, uh, that is the large number of people being infected, it was going to happen when we didn't have enough hospital beds, when we didn't, enough, uh, didn't have enough staff and so on. So now we have found the, uh, a way of getting the additional beds and additional staff, but still they can still be overwhelmed if people uh, don't take the basic precautions. Now we looked at a number of countries, Korea, China, uh, and uh, Singapore and some of the countries that were able to move a bit early and they were able to slow down the rate of the infection. Even China had stopped at about 80,000, 83,000 people and they did a very strong lockdown within Wuhan and Hebei where people didn't stop moving and uh, <clears throat> nobody was working. We can't do that in South Africa because firstly uh, our evidence showed that the viral uh, infection the pandemic uh, would not change too much even if we extended the lockdown at that point, if it was a nationwide lockdown the way we did it. However, you can still do those lockdowns in limited areas, which we have, at the moment we haven't done, but it still remains an option. But we can't um, hold the whole of South Africa uh, you know, still uh, for more, more than what we've already done because the economy of South Africa does need everyone to, uh, you know, get back to their sectors and start economic activities. And the sectors are all interrelated. So if you want to manufacture something, we have to make sure that the transport moves, the, the, the borders are moving, the offices are working. And so that interconnection means, therefore, that slowly we have to get back to a normal kind of economy, step by step. But we are saying... Uh, we, we have let, now learned something. What we have learned is that we can use masks. At that time, we didn't, we didn't, we had not started using masks. But now we're saying we can use masks, and we're saying we must use hand sanitizers. And everywhere you go, people now are very conscious about that. Not all of the people are, but many enough are. So that you now need to just emphasize that everyone must do it. Washing of the hands has been an issue, and uh, people need to know that distancing has been an issue. And everyone needs to know that and talk about this infection and say to ourselves, we have to survive this and to survive it, let's use these guidelines that we've got. Now, the simple issue here is we want to avoid a situation where one person who's got the infection can spread it to the next person. We now understand that a bit better. So it's not a contradiction. It's just that it's difficult because that's not been the culture of how we've done things. That's not how we've lived. But over the years, uh, generations of our people developed cultures because the culture that survived is the culture that made them to, uh, the, the, the culture that persisted is the culture that made them survive a difficult situation. Here we've got a pandemic, a change of culture is going to be important. And only those who focus on changing the culture will be able to survive because, you know, we can't have a situation where everybody uh, lives in the way that they've been living and continue to spread the infection because that's going to overwhelm all our health services and we will not be able to cope with the numbers. So we have to really, you know, be considerate to one another as we deal with the, um, you know, return to normality. It won't be the same normal, it's a new normal, it's a new way of life. That's the difference. Minister, we're running out of time. I think I've only got four more minutes left with you, so I'm going to ask you to try and answer as, as, as short as you can. The issue of testing. Okay. And the, there were a lot of reports coming out saying that we have a massive backlog, and I'm going to ask you firstly what the backlog is looking like right now, and others coming out and saying, and this was in some weekend newspapers, uh, drawing attention to the fact that the backlog of nine, ten days uh, of, of these tests, they, they might as well be thrown away. They're seen as medical waste because they've been sitting for too long and the virus would not be picked up anyway. Let's get responses to this now and that you should in fact be not doing this mass testing, that it should be more uh, specific now for people that are in hospitals to <coughs> save tests and those that are showing the symptoms. Let's go with that. Well, firstly, we do have a backlog and the backlog uh, is, it changes day by day. Uh, the last we had, uh, there were about three or so provinces that had a huge backlog, uh, Gauteng, Guazul uh, Natal, um, and Eastern Cape. Uh, we had reduced most of the uh, Western Cape backlog, so that we have dealt with. But we have agreed on refocusing on the 
prioritizing the specimen of those who are sick or under investigation and those who are uh, hospitalized. We've agreed on that. So we now just need to make sure everybody does that. Then the specimens that are older, it's, uh, you know, we have a bit of a challenge with that. Uh, we've been trying to increase the number of kids. <clears throat> That's why we have not uh, discarded some of the specimens. Most of the specimens uh, have been tested and they, when they're tested, they have been positive. Uh, they've shown that they can still be positive. The question of uh, how long you can keep them and so on, it's an issue that we hope that uh, you know, scientists will be able to tell us that. But in the meantime, what is important is the fact that uh, they have been concerned about how the specimens are stored and so on. Now we're saying if the specimens are obviously damaged, it's, it's okay to actually to remove those. The problem is going to all uh, 20,000 people and tell them that we've just discarded your specimen, when in fact uh, a lot of that information uh, still needs to be counted as part of the data that we have to utilize. So a lot of those issues uh, we have been under discussion about, but we are trying our best to reduce the um, to reduce the backlog, and we're increasing, trying to increase as much as possible on more kids to be able to do the tests. Last question to you, because I know you have to go. We are receiving a lot of information coming from certain hospitals around uh, the country <coughs> and some issues that are going on there. But I want to address something coming from Baraguanath. Perhaps you can help us understand this. Some are saying that a strike is imminent at Baraguanath purely because um, there has, of course, been nurses that have tested positive, doctors that have busted, uh, tested positive. There, in fact, has also been an allegation that a death of a nurse is being hidden because they died of coronavirus. Virus, and yet it's, it's, it, nothing's being done by the health ministry about this and that the state that doctors and nurses are working on in our hospitals is not good. Help us here, Dr. Mkise, what's going on in our <coughs> hospitals? Well, there are challenges in a, in a number of hospitals. Where every time we get reports, we try and investigate what's happened. We have said that all our staff must be given proper protections, PPEs to be able to work. And if there's anyone who is positive, there are protocols of how to deal with them. And in this case, we will go and find out what is happening in Paraguana. But no uh, COVID uh, uh, infection needs to be hidden, not even death. In this case, we have numbers that we have announced every now and again as to how many staff or health workers have been infected and how many have passed. We make this quite open. So if there's anyone who's mismanaging that situation, We'll have to deal with it. As it stands now, uh, we don't have adequate information, but we'll just make sure that we investigate that and deal with it. But all in all, we want to say that uh, we'll do everything to ensure that our health workers are protected and that they go to work in an area where they're well prepared and that if there's anyone who's infected, they'll follow the protocols and that if there's any information about it, we'll make it public. And so we really don't want any information hitting on anything. Thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mkise. And then, th this is it, I promise, the scooters. The scooters in the Eastern Cape. Everybody's worried about <clears throat> them and the cost. How much did they cost? Well, the issue of the scooters, uh, it really, the, the, they were meant to assist in areas where uh, health workers, commercial workers had difficulty accessing uh, some of the areas where normal regular transport and ambulances are not able to reach. Uh, there's a limited area where we thought they would be useful. Now, the cost of uh, is that would be interesting because uh, it's managed points. Once you get all sorts of reports, uh, we have to now go into that to see if there's anything that is untoward at that level. The, uh, the uh, initial number was supposed to be a hundred of these so that they could be piloted. And so uh, as far as we would be concerned, we had understood that all the procurement processes were gone in properly. But if there's anything that we find that's untoward, it will be investigated. And if there's any form of corruption, we'll act on it without any fear or favor. All right. I owe you two minutes, Minister. Thank you very, very much. I stole two minutes from you. I know you've got to go. You've got another interview. Thank you so much for talking to us here on Morning Live. Um, a lot that was covered in this interview. Thanks. And also, we have to thank you for a good job as well. That's coming from viewers. Thank you for you and your team and all you're doing. All right. Let's, uh, let's get... Uh